Hello, my name is James Batley from the ANU's Department of Pacific Affairs, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on media freedom in the Pacific in the age of COVID, which is part of our State of the Pacific series. As we get underway, let me acknowledge the traditional inhabitants of the lands on which we are meeting, in my case, the Ngunnawal, and pay our respects to their elders, past and present. We have a really excellent lineup of panelists for today's event, which promises to be a fascinating one and a particularly relevant one in the week that two journalists, Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov, were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. So I will now hand over to our chair for today's webinar, Dr. Amanda Watson, who will introduce the topic and our panelists. Over to you, Amanda. Thank you very much, James. Yes, Amanda here, and I'm delighted to be chairing this session, which will be about 90 minutes long. And we have a panel of distinguished journalists with a great deal of experience from across the Pacific to be with us here today. Uh, there will be time for you, the audience members, to ask questions. Uh, we have a couple of options for you to ask questions. You can either insert your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and you can do that at any time. Or if you wish to raise your hand and ask your question verbally so that we can hear your voice and hear what you want to explain as you're asking your question, you can click on the raise hand function. So either typing your question into the Q&A or the raise hand function. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available through the Department of Pacific Affairs website and YouTube channel. So to get on to our topic of discussion today, and I'll introduce our panel members as we go along, I'm going to ask each panel member, first of all, to give us their definition of the term media freedom and what it means to them. So the first person who I'm going to ask to give their thoughts on what is media freedom is Bernadette Carrion. She's a Palau-based journalist. She writes for a number of outlets, and she's also the Micronesian chair of the Media Freedom Watchdog Pacific Freedom Forum. Bernadette, what does media freedom mean to you? Um, good morning to all. Um, when they say media freedom, um, most, I, I guess one, one of the um, things that comes to my, my mind is uh, you are restricted or you are stopped physically from reporting. Um, but to me, media freedom is also about nonviolent disruptors. I mean, um, to me, media freedom is about um, uninhibited access to information. And I think that is when people don't or official don't authorities don't answer your phone call or they don't give up information i think that is also one of restrictions to one that is also um restriction to media freedom i think that's a uh, stopping media freedom yeah there's a non-violent ways of disrupting media media's access to information Thank you very much, Bernadette. I'm now going to throw the same question to Georgina Kekea. Georgina is a freelance journalist in Solomon Islands, and she's been in the media industry in Solomon Islands for two decades and has extensive experience across radio, television, and print media, and of course, online. And she's currently the president of the Media Association of Solomon Islands. So what does media freedom mean to you, Georgina? Thank you so much, Amanda. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, for me, media freedom basically is um, one which I am able to do my job freely without fear, uh, one that media can be able to access information when the need arise, and also uh, an environment where, you know, workers in the media industry, particularly journalists, thrive and also uh, are able to do their job without fear and uh, Reprisal, basically. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Georgina. Uh, the person who's going to share with us next is another experienced journalist. We're going to turn to Kalafi Moala, who's the editor of the Talanoa Otonga website and an award-winning journalist who's served in Tonga and across the Pacific for over 30 years. Uh, we're delighted to have you on the panel, Kalafi, today, even though unfortunately you haven't been able to get a camera, but we'll hear your voice. Uh, so Kalafi, what does media freedom mean to you? Thank you, Amanda. Uh, media freedom uh, in Tonga is, uh, is strongly supported by our own constitution, a constitution that dates all the way back to 1875. It's the freedom to speak, to write, to publish without any hindrance. And when I uh, examine what we've gone through in the last, uh, let's say, uh, decades, and what that means to Tonga, the problem has not been uh, that we don't have the freedom to speak, write or publish. The problem is what we speak about, what we write about, and what we publish is determined by someone else, most particularly by those in power. Not only that, uh, we are not free when it's determined by internal censorship, either by a media organization or by our own individual personal uh, restrictions that come because of fear of being persecuted or fear of, uh, uh, in many cases, being prosecuted. And so it's not so much that we don't have the freedom to speak, write, or publish. It's the subject, the selective meta that we speak about determined by others uh, that makes a difference to that freedom. Thank you very much. And our final panel member is Dr. Shailendra Singh. Dr. Singh is Associate Professor in Pacific Journalism and Head of Journalism at the University of the South Pacific based in Suva in Fiji. Uh, and he has a doctorate from the University of Queensland. He's also an experienced Pacific journalist and he's a member of the advisory board of the academic journal Pacific Journalism Review. Dr. Singh, what does media freedom mean to you? First of all, thank you, Amanda. It's such an honor to be on this panel. The question, what does media freedom to me, goes beyond me. It's a huge question with huge implications for Fiji and the Pacific region. So I will approach the question from a Fiji perspective. And some of the things I say might have a bearing for other countries in the region as well, especially in Melanesia. So I look at media freedom from a slightly different perspective from my colleagues, but it's related. So my approach is from a fragile state perspective for three main reasons. Uh, first of all, Fiji is a fragile state, just as PNG and the Solomons, but not quite out of instability or failed state, I hasten to, I hasten to add. Uh, second, Media freedom is really perceived from a nation state fragility perspective, even though we need to look at it from this angle as well, especially in our region. And third, I believe media freedom is anchored to the national context. Yes, there are overarching, uh, overarching principles, but in essence, Fiji media issues are different from say Australia, so this might seem like I'm stating the obvious. In theory, yes, but it is not always applied in practice. I mean, you would notice this. Okay, let's consider Fiji, which is beset by ethnic and political tensions with four clues to show for it. Okay, the national media in Fiji simply cannot ignore this history because a gung-ho approach could easily backfire. In fact, research by Professor Rovi indicates that this could well have been the case in the 2000 Fiji coup. And some reports indicate maybe in 2006 as well, the way the media covered 
and uh, sort of a certain incidents. So when we talk media freedom, we should consider the broader national context as well, not just from a journalist perspective. I believe, for example, I'll give you an example, my perspective uh, as a journalist and an academic, I believe at present, Fiji needs stability more than anything else. And that's from having lived in Fiji all my life, this is my view. And in my opinion, this context should inform the practice of journalism. The recent Honiara riot is a stark reminder of how damaging an implosion can be. And I believe that straight fragility and stability should be part of media freedom discourse, especially in our region. Okay, I'm talking stability based on democracy, not dr draconianism, because the latter is unsustainable. The problem is, as we know it, that governments use stability as an excuse to curtail criticism and even hide corruption. So we are in a bit of a difficult position. What this does is present a classical cost benefit scenario. Right? For example, what's worse, a certain level of horrible corruption or an implosion due to unrestrained media coverage? Of course, corruption is volatile on its own right, as we saw only recently in Honiara. But the question is, is there a link between media coverage and instability? In my opinion, this, uh, this question it has not been explored sufficiently enough. And uh, if you look at the writings of Professor Ratuba, sorry, before that, this question is highly relevant in Fiji PNG and the Solomons. I'm sure you all, all agree. Now, Professor Ratuva of the Macmillan Brown Center in New Zealand believes that hypercritical coverage of government encouraged the 2000 Fiji coup plotters. Okay, of course, the media did not cause the coup, but the nature of the coverage is what made the difference. It inflamed the situation, it inflamed an already volatile situation. And this is Ratuva's view. A media scholar, M. Spies, he writes about a tag dog journalism. And this type of aggressive journalism harms fledgling democracies by nurturing intolerance and diminishing faith in leaders. So this is especially risky in transitional democracies in post-conflict situation or when a country is on the verge of a conflict social conflict, internal conflict. Uh, if you read Lindsay Tanner's book, Sideshow Dumbing Down Democracy, hyper-adversarialism in media is a problem, even in Australia, if in different ways. Uh, studies in plural societies indicate a link between media and conflict. For example, Kenya, and most tragically, Rwanda, uh, so the question is, do these examples hold any lessons for Fiji and the Solomons, since both countries have experienced ethnic violence and we are not out of the woods yet? Uh, this brings in media research, which in my opinion is an underappreciated pillar of media freedom in our region. Uh, Pacific media research is lacking and this is due to a small and underdeveloped Pacific media academic fraternity. Uh, so my key argument, media freedom is more than just the freedom to report. Sometimes we overlook this. In fragile situations, it is tied to journalistic responsibility, maybe more in Fiji than perhaps Australia. Okay, so this in turn underscores training and development. So we might, uh, Shailendra, we might get to training and development of journalists uh -oh. later if we have time. Yeah. Uh, but okay. sorry, did you want... Now. My last point. Yeah. My last point is, as you can see from my presentation, 
Media freedom is deep and complex. There's much more to unpack than initially meets the eye. Okay, sorry for taking up so much time. No, that's okay. It was very interesting and important. Uh, we do actually have a question from Dr. Alphonse Aimer, who's in the Communication Arts Department at Divine Word University in Medang, Papua New Guinea. Uh, Alphonse, you may ask your question. Thanks. My question basically is about the media definitions in terms of the collective idea of media and the individual idea of media. Which or which which question might be more appropriate to Papua New Guinea or the Pacific in terms of the collective idea of media, where media seem to now have become the voice of particular individuals uh, who represent certain ideas only, rather than listen to the collective views of the community. For example, if the Solomon Islands case, it was most likely to me that the individual or the minority idea of the questions of the, uh, the governance was protected against the majority idea of how the media, the voice of the media in terms of the public view, is kind of shunned or shunned because that seemed to be undemocratic. That's my idea of how do we define the, you know, the voice of the media in that circumstances, in those circumstances. Thank you very much for the question. Does anyone on the panel want to answer, possibly starting with Georgina, given that Alphonse mentioned Solomon Islands? Thank you, uh, Amanda. Um, media, I think one thing that sometimes we tend to forget is that um, media, we are the voice, the messengers, basically. So what we cover, it does not reflect what we want to say it's basically us representing the voice of the people so coming back to your question uh when we're talking about media having um, media freedom as a working journalist for me it's being able to do my job without fear you know having to access the people that i need to access in order to balance my stories Basically, that's the simplest thing I would say. And I usually speak in simple language because I come from the radio background. So usually I try to, you know, make my language simple and easy, giving examples. And I hope you won't be offended if I do speak in simpler language, but that's, that's the way I am. But basically, as a media person, I would say that we are just messengers. And true, there are times when you see uh, social media comes into play, that's, that's, that's a different whole kind of issue altogether. You know, people now have the voice uh, themselves. Who knows what they have in their mind, whether it be propaganda, they have their own agenda. But for us, we are guided by the principles which we work under. I hope it shed light to your question. Thanks. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go on, Alphonse. Oh, no, I was just saying, thank you. That, uh, that's a good answer. But I mean, like, currently we're seeing more of the freedom of media enjoyed by those in uh, authority rather than those in, and the media seem to follow that voice in representing more than the, the general public who seem to have certain views about certain things, but the media seem to ignore their voice and more align themselves with certain, certain authoritative voices there seem to be. And uh, that seemed to be kind of a, a divide that is happening more so today than before. How we journalists can have, have that collective voice of the public become more of a voice rather than saying that oh, their voice is kind of not contributing to the uh, issues okay. of society, I issues of governance. Yeah. Just a comment. Yeah. Thanks very much, Alphonse. Do any panel members want to respond to Alphonse? No one's going to respond. I can give a very quick response. Okay, the reason why media gravitate towards people in power and prominence is because of the framework that we use for news reporting. And in that framework, prominence, people in positions of power, they are considered a prime news source, a prime news value. Whatever they say is of interest to readers, viewers, and buyers. 
And this is the reason why media will give him the giant share of the coverage, so to speak. Uh, this is not ideal, but this is the reality. The other reason is these people are more easily available. And you know, the media in, in the Pacific region is already sort of cash trapped. So sometimes we go for the easiest option out of necessity. Okay, so that's my take. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else on the panel want to answer Alfonso's question before we go on? All right, well, we might go on with our next question then, which was we've been talking about the ability for the mainstream media to conduct inquiries without hindrance or without fear. Um, and in particular, without fear of reprisal, which is an important element of a democracy. Now, we've advertised this presentation or discussion as being about the COVID-19 era. Uh, but before we talk about what's been happening since the COVID-19 pandemic started, uh, perhaps we could talk about the pre-COVID era briefly. And I'd be interested in your views, panel members, about the extent to which journalists are able to carry out their work in the Pacific uh, without hindrance or fear. So maybe Bernadette, we'll start with you. What do you think about the extent to which journalists pre-COVID were able to conduct their work? Um, for Palau or um, maybe in the North Pacific, um, one, one of the many challenges of reporting is a smaller newsroom. So there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of journalists in, in Palau, or even if there's some um, journalists in Palau, there's also that um, key of, of um, treating it as a livelihood. So, you know, we need to pay the bills. Our journalists also need to, to pay their bills. So pre-COVID, um, most of our advertising in Palau um, relies on businesses, uh, especially those who are in tourism related businesses and mostly also government uh, advertisement. I think um, the smaller the challenge is pre-COVID, there has been good advertisement, especially on holidays. But after COVID, there is also, um, you know, there's also have been shortage of advertisement. And also there is uh, in newspaper in print, there's also quick turnaround of reporters. Um, a full-time journalist. So smaller newsroom becomes smaller newsroom and also some are cash trapped. Um, I cannot imagine how, how most of us are able to uh, continue what we do. I guess it's more of a, what, you know, the passion, the commitment to do reporting. Thank you very much. Georgina, your thoughts on this question about the extent to which journalists can carry out their work? Well, thank you. For us in Solomon Islands, I would say that um, not as much as we would love to. Um, you know, we, we are quite a small population and culture, traditions all come into play when we talk about journalists trying to do their work. Um, and on top of that, we are a small media industry. Uh, each newsroom is basically for us in Solomon Islands now. I think the highest number in a newsroom would be 12. That's including the editor, the sub-editors and all that, which is quite small. And the geographical setting for us, also not um, good for us. But otherwise, when it comes to us wanting to do our job, as in comparison to Australia or, you know, other bigger states, uh, not as much as we would like, love to, especially when we when we say that we're a democratic country. Uh, tradition, culture comes into place. Everyone knows each other. How do you expect to do your job and kind of cover a story when that person is related to you? And not to forget what Dr. Shalendra Singh mentioned earlier, the fragility of the states. Uh, they also come into play. So it's, it's more than uh, the issues which journalists face are more than what uh, the IC, yeah. Thank you very much. Kalafi, your thoughts on this question?
Kalafi Mawala, did you want to share your thoughts on this question about the extent to which journalists can carry out their work? Yes, I've just had to unmute myself. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I think the greater question to me is that uh, media in general, and especially in the Pacific, has got to adapt, not only when there is a crisis like COVID-19 and some of the economic difficulties that it brings to a, a small island nation, but I think we need to go back and uh, adjust our thinking, especially when we do realize that there has been a major uh, communications and media revolution uh, that has happened over the last few years and especially uh, in the entrance of social media. Uh, because we are, we're going through an, an issue in an area here in Tonga where traditional media is suffering financially uh, because they're still trying to operate the way they were operating 20 years, 10 years ago. In the meantime, information and communication continues to go out, but it comes from sources where you don't need to finance yourself, where you don't need to get advertising. And I think this is, the, the, to me, the bigger question where we as journalists have to adjust our thinking, adjust our uh, performance and our practice and, and our work uh, to an ongoing revolution and ongoing change. And I, I just give you an example, you know, it used to be 10, even 15 years ago where print media was the main means of Tongans getting their news. Today, I will say that print media is irrelevant in Tonga. It's, people don't buy newspapers anymore. I mean, why go to a store to buy a $2 newspaper when you can get the same news through social media or through radio, for example. So radio has become a main uh, issue of communication. So uh, I guess my response is that we as journalists and we as media practitioners need to uh, adapt our thinking to the changing of times and the we're in a, in a different situation. I also want to uh, respond in, in, with the same uh, uh, issue that was raised by Shailendra, uh, where to me, uh, that's a, a, a huge one that we need to get our thinking onto. In the islands, quite a number of our people are planters or growers. And when you go in to grow corn or taro or sweet potatoes, many of us don't really think of the impact uh, of what we are going to harvest, the result, the outcome of what we're planting. We're just thinking, okay, it's full moon, it's the best time to plant our seeds and, and expect a good crop. In many ways, that's how we've been uh, operating is this. We get in there, do our job, do what we've been taunted to do, and we come in there with a story. We don't really worry so much of the impact of that story, what it's going to bring out in terms of the society and, and how they're gonna to respond to that. And I think Shailendra's uh, um, um, uh, word there, or, 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 or what he has brought out, really uh, makes it a very important issue at this time, where I think there is a crisis in media, not only in the Pacific, but worldwide, trying to adapt, trying to adjust to the revolution of communication. We need to think more about the impact of our, of our message. Now let me just close with this. The communicate in what we speak about or broadcast or write about, it's how we also do it. And often uh, we can uh, bring a much better result or create a better impact where there is stability, where there is peace, 
depending on how we communicate our message. We don't have to change the message necessarily. It's the way you communicate it. And then the other thing too is that we need to examine ourselves as journalists. Why do we need to communicate that message? And I think this reflects on uh, an issue that Alfonso had brought up earlier, that often we communicate uh, from the one side of our society, the power side, uh, where we, we source our information. And so we need to constantly make changes, what we communicate, how we communicate it, and why we communicate it. And, and, and that makes us a little bit more sensitive to the kind of results uh, that we impact in our society. I, uh, to me, I think what Shailendra is bringing out is, is helping us to, to think a little bit more maturely <laughs> and responsibly about the kind of freedom that we have. Uh, it's, it's, it's not only important, uh, the kind of information that needs to be communicated without compromise, but maybe we need to adjust our ways of communicating it and constantly ask ourselves, what are our motives? Uh, is it political? Is it cultural? Is it religious? Why is it that this particular story is front page and not other stories. So just uh, an input there. Thanks, Kalafi, thanks very much. And Dr. Singh, what is your view on this question about the extent to which journalists have been able to conduct their work in the Pacific in the pre-COVID era? First of all, thank you, Kalafi, who has been an inspiration for me when I started out in journalism. And uh, we saw him as a very strong freedom fighter in Tonga, and some of the democratic reforms achieved in Tonga was through the work done by Kalafi Moala through his small media organization. So that shows you the kind of impact media can have in a country and in society. Okay, the question is to what extent are journalists able to carry out their work in the Pacific? This is very pertinent to Fiji, where some interesting, challenging things have been happening since 2006. I believe Fiji media likely have the toughest in the Pacific region since the 2000 Media Act was implemented. Okay, so what happened was under, once this act was implemented, the media for the first time in Fiji's history uh, became, uh, came under government control. Before this, media was self-regulated like in most other democracies, including Australia and New Zealand. So what is really fantastic when you look back is that before 2006, Fiji media freedom and the way Fiji media operated was almost on a par with Australia and New Zealand. And the whole scenario has now changed. If you look at the Media Act, it criminalizes even journalism ethics with heavy fines and jail sentences for breaches as minor as a missing byline. Now, media organizations face fines of $100,000 and editors and publishers $25,000. This is a small fortune in Fiji, enough to financially cripple a media worker or an entire media organization. So in defense, what the government says is that no one has been prosecuted so far, which is fair enough. But this could change tomorrow, especially with media getting more critical over the years. And we have elections looming in 2022. So I see the Media Act as a guillotine that can swing into action at any time of the minister's choosing. So what's happening in Fiji is that the media that choose to criticize government are always looking over their shoulders. And we are thankful so far, no one has been charged or prosecuted, but what does the future hold? It looks very uncertain. Um, so, and this is why the Fiji media are associated with self-censorship. For instance, the Reporters Without Borders Press Freedom Indexes. And if studies such as by Fiji journalist Ricardo Morris claiming that Fiji media are in self-censorship mode are anything to go by, then the Fiji media are in trouble, maybe dying a slow death. If media are in dire straits, so is the country. And this is simply because 
as rights campaigners, such as jo Jonathan Day, for example, remind us journalistic self-censorship is not to be taken lightly. It's a threat to democracy as a whole. So self-censorship is not just a media concern. It is a concern for every Fiji citizen. The public can overlook this because of divide and rule tactics by demonizing and otherizing media. You know, Donald Trump is often blamed for this, but this trend has been with us for a while now. And sometimes we forget that limiting media rights is limit, limiting our own rights as well. And I say this because some people in Fiji initially supported the media. Okay, so I'll stop for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's turn to the COVID-19 era now, and I'll go to Bernadette first. Could you talk about the media's reporting of COVID-19 in Palau, Bernadette? Because um, uh, we had a, this understanding among our, our media members that um, COVID-19 is a public health issue. Um, we try and do away with um, politicizing the COVID-19 um, issues because it's something that will affect everyone. And also we're not experts, we're not, uh, you know, physicians. So, we agree that we will treat it, uh, we will cover it as a public health issue. And one thing about uh, Palau is there have been a, a good relationship between the Ministry of Health and uh, um, Palau Media. We actually have a chat group, a WhatsApp chat group. So before we, we try and put out um, stories about COVID-19, we, we check with them. It, it doesn't mean that they're trying to censor us, that, but we, we have this 24 hour access to them that um, this is happening. Uh, are you confirming it? So I think um, in Palau, we have been very, very um, good in covering COVID-19. I think I would like to say that it contributed to less um, vaccine hesitancy. Um, Palau was a one, if one of the highest vaccination rate in um in the pacific and i think it's uh, the media coverage in palau has contributed to that i would say that in in my experience like i would go to the vaccination center and cover uh the rollout of vaccination and and people will message me and ask me and say so how was it how was the vaccination and i would say oh it was smooth and then the next day you will see people going to the vaccination center. I think when it comes to COVID-19, we had built a good relationship with the Palau Ministry of Health and, and its authority. It doesn't mean that we are, you know, it doesn't mean that we are biased towards them, but as I said, this is a public health issue. There, it, there shouldn't be politics in an issue that um, will affect vulnerable audiences that will affect all of us. Thanks, Bernadette. And Georgina, could you talk about the COVID-19 coverage in Solomon Islands? Thank you, uh, Amanda. Yes, I think for us in Solomon Islands, I think um, the coverage is okay when it comes to COVID-19, um, except when it comes to other issues, you know, being the media, you have to uh, also try to uh, there are other stories uh, inside COVID-19 as well that needs to be uncovered. Uh, it's really something which we are still trying to strike a balance with. You know, it comes back to uh, your obligation as well, do no harm kind of thing. And then also uh, these are stories that needs to be told as well. So I think for such a pandemic as the COVID-19, it's, it's new not only for us in Solomon Islands, but I would say in other Pacific newsrooms as well. So how do we strike a balance when it comes to reporting on COVID-19? Because apart from the uh, health issues, of, there are also other issues that needs to be uh, you know, told by the media. And uh, speaking of that, if you don't mind, I, I will also respond to David's question about um, the misinformation, disinformation, which 
government uh, trying to protect. Uh, for us in Solomon Islands, I would say that more and more journalists are now being recruited by the government. Basically, uh, the government ministries, they are now putting in uh, public relation officers, communication officers, while it's okay, but then for us in the mainstream, we see that like it's a buffer. Uh, us trying to get information while you have PR officers there with journalists or journalists in background, uh, they're doing their job, uh, accessing the people to get the information that you need. Uh, sometimes it's quite difficult. So it's in a way it's affecting media freedom where journalists, you do not really have direct access to persons which you would like to talk to because having PR or communication officers there uh, while well, you want to get to the person that you want to speak to, um, it's really hard, uh, you know, I, I call them buffers because they're there for a reason. And um, that's something which, which is quite um, a thing which we need to really think about, especially when it comes to having the freedom for uh, journalists and media organizations to do their job. But for the COVID-19 pandemic, yeah, we, we do have a lot of coverage, but having to you know, striking a balance in between the controversial issues as well. That that seems to be a thing that we, we need to work on. Yeah. Thanks. Kalafi, your thoughts on this question? Yes, uh, there has been a, a very, very good coverage of the issue in Tonga. Uh, I think if you look in all media operations, it's, it's been wonder, wonderful from the beginning. Although as we go along, we, we started realizing that people were getting to a stage where they were no longer concerned about the virus, they were concerned about vaccinations. And, and so the battle then begins to shift. Uh, so that in Tonga, we are not so much battling against the virus, we're battling against information or misinformation it seems to be a lot more dangerous than the virus itself. And so that has been our experience over the past. Uh, things that has helped us along the way was that all of a sudden we had a scare uh, that somebody had tested positive and come into Tonga. You have to remember that Tonga has been COVID free all the way up to this time. And because of this scare, the Ministry of Health and the government acted immediately to lock down Tonga. I mean, we were in lockdown for a week. And uh, I mean, from those of you that know Tonga and Tongans, try to lock down a bunch of Tongans in, in one location. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, but what it did, it really brought a lot of people to get vaccinated uh, and shows that, that, that people were not really uh, against vaccination, but they, they were really, um, some of them were just kind of didn't care, you know, or, or they were busy with other things. So that really brought a whole wave of, of vaccination so that we in Tonga right now are at 93% uh, first time uh, uh, those people that are vaccinated, 71% those that have been double vaccinated and in still growing. Of course, this is something that's uh, very much pleasing to the health uh, uh, people. But uh, I would say that we continue ourselves uh, as media uh, to battle misinformation so that we can give calm in people. Uh, it was not, the issue was not get vaccinated or not get vaccinated. The issue was battling against misinformation. What is the truth? What are the facts concerning the information you're getting? And I think, uh, media we've, we've gotten somewhere quite positively in that regard. And when there was a lockdown announced in Tonga Kalafi, was the media still free to go about and conduct inquiries and so on? 
Yes, the, the lockdown, of course, was uh, with curfew. Uh, mostly, they took place in the in the evening. Uh, but one of the things that has happened is when when there was a collective decision by media to really trust and source of information referred to earlier. We're, we're not doctors, we're not experts in this, so it's the Ministry of Health where there are the health officials and, and health, uh, uh, where there are the doctors and nurses. And so we began then a very close relationship with them and they were able to give out their information. It really has helped uh, a number of media uh, operations uh, because the Ministry of Health brought advertising and, uh, and, and board advertising time on them. Uh, so uh, when the difficulty took place then concerning uh, uh, misinformation, and then when there was the lockdown, journalists were still allowed to do their job well. And it, it comes out of a relationship uh, that had been built up over weeks and months to collectively, journalists, health officials, everyone in the community to battle this virus. Thanks, Kalafi. And Shailendra, your thoughts on this question? Yeah, I mean, for Fiji, COVID has been a disaster in every sense of the word. At its peak, we had the world's highest per capita infection rate. We are in a much better place now, thanks to the efforts of the government. Um, you know, the population is highly vaccinated, I believe over 80%. Um, media were considered essential service and reporters could move freely, but there were problems. At a national media conference, one reporter was rebuked in a rather condescending manner for asking illegitimate questions. Uh, the Fiji Times reported how COVID posed a huge challenge for reporters with reporters misunderstood by the public and humiliated by state officials. There's the Fiji Times direct quote. After a while, the health ministry press conferences were replaced by media releases on Facebook. So reporters could not even ask questions. They had to go on Facebook and just get the press release and that served as the government statement. And Fiji was also among Pacific governments accused by several media freedom watchdogs of using an emergency. The Fiji Sun column, the military commander simply doubled down. They insisted that the government had good reasons to curtail media freedom. So in my opinion, that's debatable when a study by Kant, Maria and Titi Fanua, these guys work at USP, their study showed widespread social media misinformation. So the question that comes to mind is, at such times, shouldn't media be left alone to dispel fake news? Uh, that there was some misreporting is undeniable. One Fiji newspaper was thought to give a prominent anti-vaxxer too much space. I remember coming across a Solomon Islands newspaper, which reported that a girl's arm became magnetic after vaccination. And this was well after this myth had been thoroughly dispelled in other countries. But these incidents betray a long-standing problem. I mean, they did not, a long-standing problem in the in newsroom capacity building. And this stands out even more in crisis situations. So our newsrooms lack cap uh, capacity and this stands out even more in crisis situations and it becomes really risky. And our research this year found that Pacific journalists are still amongst the youngest, most inexperienced and underqualified in the world. And this is partly due to journalists attrition because of uncompetitive salaries. Profit margin in Pacific media is low because the advertising market is low. So we are constantly losing staff. It's been a perpetual problem. After surveying over 200 Pacific journalists in nine countries 
we concluded the obvious, the training Trump's legislature, a punitive legislation on its own is short-sighted. It does nothing for capacity building, if only governments would listen. In terms of a long-term solution, it's the Australians doing the training with some really impressive results. And they're working with local people as well. So my concluding remark here is that training, not legislation, should be the building block of crisis reporting. A training not in the face of a crisis, but well before it. Thank you. Thank you, Shailendra. Uh, we have an audience question from Tess newton Kane, so we'll go to you now, Tess. Thanks, Amanda, and thank you to the panel um, for your contributions so far. Um, I've just uh, I've looked back at um, the outcome statement that arose from the Melanesia Media Freedom Forum that was held here at Griffith um, in uh, 2019. And Georgina was a is a member of that forum, and I was struck by a, a couple of item, an item in there that that we haven't really um, touched on since. So I'd be keen to get the in, insights of this panel. In the outcome statement, the forum said we call on all development partners and the international community to one recognize and advocate for the role of the free and independent media as an essential accountability institution and to act as role models by allowing their own free and independent media to thrive. So I'd be keen to hear from the panel members what they um, would want or expect from development partners and the international community more generally in terms of supporting a free and independent media in the region. Thank you. Thanks, Tess. Who would like to respond first to Tessa's question from the panel? Thank you, Tess. I think I'll go first, if you don't mind. Okay, yeah. Um, I would give an example, basically, um, from the recent crisis that was here in Solomon Islands. And Sue has really um, written a story about us from Solomon Islands, especially journalists during the um, riots and protests. Mainly, I think, in when it comes to, you know, journalist solidarity is one thing that we want to see from our neighboring countries, even if it's not in a form of material things or funding, at least showing the support that you are here for us. And if you see something happening, like for example, the Civicus uh, report saying that Solomon Islands has now been classified as narrowed, previously it was open when it comes to contribution in the civic space you know, at least some sort of saying, hey, what's happening in Solomon Islands? At least we are all good at writing um, uh, reports as well as, you know, giving out um, talks. Having that support would be very much appreciated. Like, okay, this is happening in Solomon Islands. What is happening? You know, at least some sort of statement coming out from you partners out there. Okay, this is not on. Why is Solomon Islands now narrowed? or even for us when we need you know, solidarity um, information or statements coming from you would be very much appreciated. Those sort of things showing that we are in this together uh, as journalists, as media people, we are all one big family regardless of which countries we represent. I think that's for me. Thanks very much, Georgina. Do any other panel members want to respond to Tessa's question? Bernadette? Um, I would like to see a more um, support to local um, local coverage as um, we can have, have enough capacity building training local journalists but but when I say um, training local journalists you know um, focus or give more um, give more the space to local journalists I know there's a lot of um, international coverages or regional coverages when when, when some um, outside reporters will will be writing stories about the Pacific. I think as as um, we have seen in um, Solomon Islands, 
I think it highlighted how um, local journalists are covering the, the stories. They're giving voice to what's happening to um, to Solomon Islands. And I think that's what we we need it right now. And also, of course, support support from our um, um, neighboring Pacific countries. And also, and then I think that um, Georgina and Calafi will agree with this. We we might have diverse um, diverse uh, strategic geographical. Um, we're separated. We're unique, but we're separated. And I think one thing about the Pacific journalists is we um, collaborate with each other. We know each other even if we don't see each other. We talk to each other all the time. So if um, that will continue and that's great. Thanks very much. We might go to Nick McClellan now, who also has a question for our panel. Nick, if you could ask your question, please. Thanks, Amanda, and thanks for a wonderful session. Um, my question was about uh, um, what resources and audience interest there is around uh, regional and international affairs. Um, you know, journalists uh, and media organizations are stretched to cover local stuff. Um, could you talk a little bit about how much the interest there is from your audience at your, in your place about uh, regional affairs? And any suggestions about how coverage of regional affairs around the forum, transboundary issues, fisheries and so on, could be improved, um, um, uh, you know, as we work together? Thanks a lot. Shailendra, it looks like you want to start on that. I think as Nick McLennan said, uh, local media houses, organizations are fully stretched covering local issues. And there seems to be a tendency or understanding on the part of the local editors that local news is what sells. So even though they cover regional news uh, because of staffing shortages and all that, they don't put too much thought into it. They get these wire services and, you know, pet news, peanut news and all that. And I get the sense that they just might be just sort of putting it on the pages without giving too much thought as to what they are reporting on. Uh, the focus is uh, local and regional news. And yes, indeed, you know, issues like fisheries, for example, the environment on a regional basis needs far more coverage and awareness in the region. And I would say that editors, may, editors maybe need training and they have to put more thought into these issues rather than uh, treat regional news as a filler or, you know, as not that relevant because regional news is becoming more and more crucial for every country in the region. We are all connected. And I think journalists need to realize that perhaps some more training might help. Thanks, Shailendra. Does anyone else on the panel want to answer Nick's question about regional and international news? Yes, I, I may just say a word there. Uh, in Tonga, there is a lot of interest about regional and international news. Uh, Tongans have always been interested. That's why there are a lot more of us living outside of Tonga than in Tonga. Uh, in the sense, uh, we have a very strong population in New Zealand, Australia, in America. And so therefore, uh, you, you talk to any family in Tonga and they've got a member or relatives that are living outside of the country. So there is an, an interest of what's happening over there. For example, take the uh, riots that took place in the Solomons. I mean, there was a lot of interest. And yet when I listen to the radio and I uh, see even some of the social media posts, there was very little coverage of that. And so those are the issues where we felt, yeah, we've, we've got to provide some coverage. But it's not just coverage of, uh, of a, uh, a riot. Uh, remember that in 2006, we had kind of the same thing that happened here in Nukalofa in Tonga. Uh, but we need to go behind it and, and, and talk about it, which is why it's so important for us to talk directly with uh, uh, and, and read reports from people like Georgina, who, who was there on the ground and saw what was happening and get the analysis of why what happened happened. 
And so it's so important, I believe, that, uh, that we, we work together and get a collaboration on how we can get regional and international news uh, edited and fitted into our local coverage. It's very important. And the amazing thing is some of the issues that we deal with locally are really international and regional issues, like climate change, like even the COVID uh, uh, crisis that we've gone through, uh, quite a lot of them. Uh, even a problem in Tonga with, uh, with uh, drugs uh, that we are encountering as a nation. It's, it's not just drugs in Tonga, it's drugs that have been shipped into Tonga and then shipped out of Tonga to other places. And of course, some of the uh, arrests that took place in New Zealand just in the last couple of weeks, uh, where Tongans were involved, where uh, there was a shipment that went, came from Tonga of uh, uh, cassava and, and other crops. Uh, that there was a, a shipment of drugs in there. So uh, that's regional, that's international. And, uh, and we need as uh, a journalist to work out a way of how we can collaborate uh, on a regular basis, consistent basis on having uh, a news, particularly in those issues that affect us locally. Thanks very much, Kalafi, and thanks to the large number of audience members who are with us. If anyone in the audience wants to post a question on anything to do with media freedom in the Pacific, we have just under half an hour to go. So now's your chance. You can either raise your hand by clicking on raise hand, or you can type a question into the Q&A box and I'll come to the ones that have already been entered shortly. Uh, we, our next question is from Jemima Garrett. Over to you, Jemima. My question is about this issue of sensational media and negative impacts, um, badly motivated media um, in the broadest sense. So, I mean, my perspective working in the region would be that the biggest problem by far is in the social media area, but that's not to say there isn't a problem in the mainstream media area. And I mean, here in Australia, we have um, Media Watch, a whole program keeping tabs on the problems with the media. Um, my question to the panel is about how we deal with this. Um, I mean, I see in the Pacific um, that the media representative bodies haven't had enough um, resources to be able to articulate for um, what the role the media is meant to do in a democratic society. So there's a, a sort of loss of focus on um, the fact that the media is meant to be playing the fourth estate role. Um, the media has to do something to live up to that standard. Um, but also I do know that there's been some work being done right across the region um, on media ethics and media codes of ethics. So what's being done and how should the region um, and how should the region's media um, separate itself and um, play that role of the quality independent media as opposed to, I guess, the sensational tabloid media? Thanks, Jemima. Which panel member would like to respond first? To Jemima? Jo Georgina? Oh, sorry, we'll go Georgina and then Kalafi. Sorry, Kalafi. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for, for your question, Jemima. Thank you so much for that. Uh, you, you're right when you say that uh, media, uh, you know, groupings or associations like the one that we have in Solomon Islands, we have the Media Association of Solomon Islands, Masi. We, we do, with the support from PACMAS, have managed to work on our code of ethics, uh, made a review to it. But then um, the issues, the challenges basically is that we, we have to be always, you know, uh, doing our, uh, you know, be, be the watchdog as well. And we do not have that mechanism in place. Uh, we do have the Masi, but, but then it's, it, it, it's not as established as we would love it to be. So we did have a program called Media Watch as well. And I found out that with, with this kind of system in place, it, it, it helps, especially when, when we want to enforce the standards. It, we sort of do this ourselves when we have this kind of, a system in place. So basically, when we have media watch and you know always keeping the editors uh, in check, uh, it works for us. So ha not having that in place, that's where we see a fallout um, in the newsroom. But when we have that system in place, uh, and then we have day-to-day -day checks, like every week we do have the media watch program, 
calling you know editors out so usually we focus on the journalists we forget about the editors who controls the newsroom so trying to bring that back in check as well like saying that it's not the journalists it's the editors that controls what goes out in the paper as well as the sub editors so putting them on the spot basically it helps to keep uh you know the principles and work in place but uh, it's a progress which we hope we will you know get to in the coming years yeah thank you so georgina the solomon islands media watch is not in existence anymore is that what you're saying um it's in existence it we will it's under review now uh you know because of the uh it, we do this voluntarily of course but the but the airtime is funded for by DFAT, but we will continue next year yeah thanks and kalafi you wanted to answer jemima garrett's question is we have we have found in tonga uh, that our greatest need uh, in order to unify us as traditional media to improve quality and to continue to maintain issues like media freedom and so on from year to year our greatest need is training and uh, according to the quality of training that we give our practitioners that we give our youth, our young people on media, is the kind of quality that we produce uh, with the performance of our media people. Uh, one of the things that has happened to us in Tonga, I've noticed that a lot of really sharp young people, they come in and they go out to schools like where Shailindra uh, is, to, to uh, USP, they go to AUT and a lot of institutions for training. The amazing thing is when they come back, they don't come back and work for media anymore. <laughs> and the reason for that is because media cannot afford their wages uh, that, that comes together with their BA or their master's degree in journalism. And so you find a lot of our top trained journalists are actually working for a department in government or working for an institution that can pay them their wage. So we end up again with a lot of young people, untrained uh, uh, practitioners. And this is why we're working together, uh, thanks to uh, Australia, ABC, and, uh, and PECMES, uh, for example, that have helped us in funding short-term training or workshops and seminars that we run throughout the year. Uh, on issues like media freedom, on issues like uh, how to report on parliament, issues like corruption, how do, how do we investigate corruption? Uh, many, many things like that that our journalists have not gone through in terms of training. We are bringing it through workshop because we cannot send them out uh, to institutions uh, to universities, universities to get their training. Although it's encouraging that we have a, a course here called Tihetong uh, uh, Institute of Higher Learning, where there is a journalism course that runs it, offers a certificate. I've also heard that the USP campus here in Tonga is wanting to uh, start a um, a course on journalism, and all of that is is good news to us. That's wonderful, uh, but. Again, we need to continue the training, the short-term workshops, seminars for the practitioners right now, for people that have not had that, uh, that training. So definitely, I have found that this is a solution. This is an answer to us. It helps unite us. It helps us think together. It helps us really fulfill some of the fundamentals of journalism. It helps us continue to see what our purpose is uh, and our relationship to our nation and, and moving things forward. So uh, I, th I think it is an answer to Jemima's uh, 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 question. That's at least what we're doing or trying to do in Tonga. And that has really produced some good fruit uh, in Tonga. I personally, in fact, most of my time personally is involved in some of these training workshops and, and seminars uh, to train our people. We have got some very smart, some very brilliant journalists. They just need a little bit of training to encourage them along the way.
Thanks, Thank you. Kalafi, for all your very good work. Uh, we have some questions in the Q&A box that I want to ask the panel members to turn their attention to. The first one is from Kelvin Anthony, and it says it's a question for Dr. Shailendra Singh. It says, I agree that media freedom is complex and much more than meets the eye. I'd like to know your thoughts on what's the place for activist journalists in the region, given the changing nature of the media and political landscape in the Pacific. Dr. Singh? Okay, just a quick answer to Kelvin. I think they have a really major role to play. And regionalism becomes very important because the legislation in Fiji is quite severe. Uh, so in Fiji, it's limited how much you can do without really taking a huge risk. So things are subdued in Fiji, but our colleagues uh, can you know, support us from outside the region. And uh, given the climate in Fiji and maybe in some other Pacific Island countries, uh, given the trend that's being brought about by social media, the abuse of social media, governments are passing legislation to control social media, which is also affecting mainstream media. So they are caught in the crossfire. And uh, so this, there's a worrying trend in the region and there's definitely a need in a place for journalistic activists. And we also need to team up with other civil society organizations who can speak up on behalf of journalists if they are taken in, for example. You know, they can sort of, raise an outcry, maybe that can be a deterrent. I hope that answers your question, Kelvin. Thanks, Shailendra, and thanks for raising the point about the importance of others speaking out if a journalist is taken into detention. Bernadette, did you want to answer that? Um, to, to Kelvin's question, I think, I think in my opinion as a journalist, um, journalism is also a form of activism. And I also saw some questions about climate change. I know <clears throat> there's all, we always say, there's always two sides to a story. But when it comes to impact of climate change in the Pacific, is there really another side to the story? I mean, it's something that we have been experiencing and I think most developed nations could not grasp how it's impacting us. So yeah, I mean, when does, journalism and then activism begins. And I think if you are pursuing the truth, then that is a form of activism. And yes, there are some stories that are, you know, that don't have two sides when it comes to rights of um, women, gender, um, gender-based violence. So I agree with, with Kelvin that there are some stories that, um, that us journalists, will have to seek the truth. And if we want to seek the truth, then we also demand change. Thanks very much. Now, Joe Chandler's put the next question into the Q&A box uh, and said really interesting discussion and so on. But her question specifically is about the Guardian's Pacific project over the last couple of years. So what are thoughts of the panel members on the Guardian's Pacific project? I think um, Amanda, I'm sorry. I just want to uh, get clarification. You're talking about the Guardian, the newspaper Guardian project? Yes, I think it's funded through the Judith Nielsen Institute. I think that's what Joe Chandler is referring to, the Guardian's project that's funded through the Judith Nielsen Institute. Do any of you have any comments on that? Any panel members? Mm. I think if you don't mind, I'll go, go with that. One thing which I found, especially as a Pacific journalist, when it comes to issues, uh, you know, the Guardian, the platform, it, it's good. We, we like it. But when it comes to the um, angle, the stories itself, yeah, we want to tell the stories our way. Um, we appreciate uh, this kind of platform, but when you really don't have the freedom to report or tell a story in a way which you think is the way which 
the Pacific audience or, you know, everyone has their own agenda, their own angle. Yeah, that's, that's basically what I would like to say on that. And if you compare it with the um, Pacific Prepared uh, of ABC, the Pacific Prepared, it's basically the journalists pitching in their stories, their own angles and how they, they cover the story, it's, it's up to them giving them the freedom to, you know, write and express the, you know, stories as it is. That's basically what I would say about this. When you have this kind of platform, you, you really have to find out what really, what really works and what what's really suits uh, us in a way. Like, you know, the people with disability usually say nothing about us without us. Thanks. And Sue Ahern, the editor of the Pacific Newsroom, which is an outlet on Twitter and other spaces, says that they try, try to use local coverage of regional stories as much as possible, rather than stories from international outlets. Um, and I have a question from Elise Howard, a colleague of mine here at the Department of Pacific Affairs at ANU. She says, I have a similar question to Nick McClellan on the reporting of regional issues, but Elise's question is specifically on climate change. Climate change is an issue discussed in regional and global forums, but how is this issue reported locally? Uh, Bernadette actually mentioned it uh, a moment ago, uh, but which panel member would like to answer Elisa's question on how climate change is covered in the local media? Maybe Halafi. I can uh, start out here. Uh, in Tonga, there are two sides to climate change. The one side is a very um, academic discussion that sometimes are carried by media. Uh, it's the side where there are a lot of meetings uh, that goes on both uh, locally, regionally, and internationally. And uh, that same site also, there's a lot of money in the millions of dollars that are being talked about and discussed. So that's one side of climate change that we sit here in Tonga and view it. And, and, and a lot of people understand that's what climate change is all about. Uh, in terms of understanding the issues, there's very little uh, that happens. And the part that we're trying to cover in terms of local news here in relation to climate change is that there, 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 there's a family that lives on an island in Ha'apai, for example, northern islands of Tonga, and they've lost their beach. Uh, the, the, the island has is, is been, uh, a good portion of it have been washed out. And uh, people who are in the know are telling them that that's a result of climate change. There are people that are in uh, Tonga Tapu that are living out where, I mean, everything seems to have been okay 20, 30 years ago concerning their waterfront. But today they have to move their houses uh, uh, inland because of the kind of things that are happening uh, uh, out there. So there are people that are living most probably as a result of the impact of climate change in their day-to-day -day life. They don't understand it as such. But all I'm just saying is that there are these two sides. Uh, if as media, we cover the one side of meetings of the academic uh, reason for climate change and all of that, we will get paid for it because you know there's good money in there. If we're covering a story of a family that have been uh, uh, displaced, there's no money in there. And yet they are the sufferers of climate change. Yeah. So I just want to mention that, that there's these two views of what climate change is all about. And, and that's where we are at here uh, in Tonga right now. Thank you for all of the contributions and we won't have time to go to all the questions. There's one from Sadana Sen and other questions coming in now fastly, uh, fast and furious, but I'm going to allow the panel members time to give their final comments 
before we wrap up this session on media freedom in the Pacific. And again, thanks to all the many people who've joined us throughout this very interesting 90 minute discussion. So we have these four wonderfully experienced journalists on the panel. So I'm gonna ask each of them for their final comments on media freedom in the Pacific. And we'll go to Bernadette Carrion in Palau first. Thanks, Bernadette. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, and um, Dr. Amanda for hosting this panel. Um, for the Pacific Freedom Forum, we want to be continuing to support and act as a media watchdog in the Pacific, but um, we have talked about it, about the challenge of funding. We, all, we also do this on a voluntary basis. We compared to other media watchdogs in the Pacific. I'm not sure with um, with Georgina, but um, we don't have that luxury of uh, getting funded. And we hope we could. Um, and also, um, we also hope from our side that we continue to do it. There, I guess we haven't been much focusing on some of the areas, which we hope by next year, we will be able to do. But of course, with the help and support of other um, Pacific uh, journalists and Pacific media watchdog. But as um, a message from, from the region, um, I think as journalists, we just always have to continue to report on. I know there are challenges, but um, I think we, we are all here with the passion and with that, um, with the focus on why we're here is to report and to be, and to be the voice of the people. Thanks, Bernadette. Georgina Kekea in Solomon Islands, your final thoughts. Thank you so much, uh, Amanda, for uh, uh, giving us this platform for us to share our thoughts. Um, as always, having this sort of discussion, I hope will help us understand the issues, the needs, the differences uh, that we have uh, in the different um, areas that we work from, especially different countries. Uh, only by having this sort of conversation will help us to progress further as we you know, strive to do better in our different counties and especially when it comes to media freedom. Um, it's very important and very crucial at this point in time, as we see digital media, social media uh, on the go already and the mainstream media, we, we really need uh, to find what really works for us and having the support from the likes of uh, all of you out there will certainly help us in the Pacific. So having this sort of conversation, I really appreciate it. And I hope from this uh, conversation uh, forward, uh, we see more, uh, you know, collaborations as we uh, move along. Thank you, Tomas. Thanks, Georgina. Kalafi Moala, your final thoughts and comments? Yes, my final thoughts and just expression of gratitude. Uh, uh, Amanda, thank you for your leadership in this discussion. Brilliant, wonderful indeed. And I want to make a special commendation uh, on Georgina Kekea. You've been a huge and read your reports and watched the situation there with much emotion. And I just want to publicly commend you. I want to thank you, Bernadette, for your activism. You're just one of those quiet ones that continue to be an activist and also Shailender for being a leader regional with new ideas, continue to promote the training that we so need. And I go away from this session with two really key things. One is the sharing that Shailender uh, brought up is something very new uh, in, in a sense to me, thinking about the impact on your society, the stability, the kind of results that you want to do. I, I think this is something that we, is uh, journalists need to seriously think about. And then the other one is definitely the activism that was brought by one of those that, that uh, question. We must continue to be activists. And that's the kind of journalists that is needed this day 
And we need to pass on the torch to a new generation that are coming up, a new generation that are far more apt to comply with everything that goes on. But we need activists that are able to make a difference into our different communities. Thank you so much. What a privilege to be part of this panel today. We were privileged to have you, Kalafi. Thank you. And Dr. Shailendra Singh, your brief final comments, please. Dr. Singh, did you want to add anything? Yeah. Okay, yes, hang on. Okay, so what I'm gonna do in the final minutes I have left is draw the link between financial viability and media freedom. You know, this is something we don't discuss often enough, but it's now a very serious issue in the Pacific. Uh, in my opinion, we could be facing the biggest crisis in Pacific media history. I would even describe it as an exist existential threat and allow me to qualify that statement. See, Pacific marketing advertising market is small to begin with. Even before COVID, this revenue model was seriously compromised by the digital disruption. So the question now is whether COVID is the final nail in the vulnerable Pacific media coffin. Um, we need to talk to media owners for a clearer picture, but it's a crucial issue because media financial viability, as I said, strikes at the very heart of media freedom, the theme for today's discussion. The thing we, are, we might be seeing is that financially weak media may close down or downsize. And this in our region where media are already small and scarce, so hopefully Pacific media is more resilient than I envisage. But I have a quick question, uh, which I'll answer myself. I mean, uh, what happens if there's not enough media in our country? And we need to look no further than the Phoenix Islands debacle. I'm told Kiribati citizens had little idea until the deal was done. So what this tells me is that without journalism to raise the alarm, the entire country suffers from lack of transparency. You know, leaders connect with impunity. Uh, impacts of media's financial viability are magnified in today's geopolitical climate. Financially struggling media organizations are vulnerable for appropriation. And I believe foreign interests may be closing it. And there's a good paper on this by the DPA's Deng Zhang and Amanda Watson, our chairperson, on China's specific media strategy. And it pinpoints what I've been highlighting for a while now, the Pacific media are small in size, but huge in strategic value, which the Chinese understand. So because Pacific media are small, their strategic value is easily overlooked. So the DPA's leading role in today's discussion is much appreciated. I believe we cannot look at Pacific development, democracy or security in isolation of news media. Thank you. Thanks. And so on behalf of colleagues who've helped me to organize this here at the Department of Pacific Affairs at Australian National University, I'll bring this to a close. I want to sincerely thank our very experienced journalists who've joined us from Palau, Solomon Islands, Tonga and Fiji and shared their insights. Thanks to everyone who asked questions and sorry that we didn't get time for all of them. Uh, the Department of Pacific Affairs will have other State of the Pacific events in this online format uh, in the coming year. And in the meantime, thanks again, everyone for being here today.